We get a ton of questions on canola oil. Is it healthy? Is it poison? Uh, what's the deal? So today we're going to go through the available scientific evidence on the health effects of consuming canola oil. We'll look at lipids like cholesterol and ApoB, glucose metabolism, fasting glucose, fasting insulin, insulin resistance, inflammation, oxidation, risk of cancer, risk of death, the works. This video is going to be a little longer than our usual fare, so bear with me. This is the only way that we can get clarity. I know that there's a ton of claims being made out there, and usually without showing you any evidence. So that is what we're doing today. We're not going to look at an isolated trial that we handpick. We're going to look at broad data sets, meta-analyses, large cohort studies, so you can really get a sense of balance of evidence. Last thing before we dive in, we're not sponsored by Big Canola or Big, uh, big Seed Oil. Uh, we don't have any sponsorships on the channel. We're completely independent. And I don't have a personal preference on this either. I really don't care if, if canola oil turns out to be great or terrible. Happy to remove or add more to my diet if the evidence justifies. So let's get into it. The first thing we're going to look at is the effect of canola oil on lipids and cardiovascular disease. There are several large meta-analyses. This one, for example, combined 42 randomized controlled trials. And it's interesting because it compared canola oil to a couple other fats head to head. Olive oil, sunflower seed oil, and also foods higher in saturated fat, like butter. When they looked at trials comparing canola oil to olive oil, they found LDL cholesterol was a bit lower on canola, but ApoB, which is a better metric of cardiovascular risk, wasn't significantly different between the two. Olive oil is an interesting comparison because most people feel safer about it, and we have a lot of evidence for its safety and benefit, and also it's the closest to canola in terms of nutrient composition. They're both predominantly monounsaturated fats. When they compared canola to sunflower seed oil, identical, lower LDL cholesterol on canola, but ApoB, no significant difference. And comparing to saturated fat, LDL cholesterol and ApoB were both lower on canola oil, and triglycerides were lower as well. Other lipid parameters like VLDL cholesterol, ApoA1, LP little a, HDL cholesterol were not significantly different in any of those head-to-head -head comparisons. Same with blood pressure, also not significantly different. We can find individual trials where some of these parameters change, but it doesn't reach significance in these large meta-analyses with dozens of trials. So we're looking at this to give you a sense of big picture, what keeps working over and over. So this meta-analysis concluded that the greatest benefit was seen when about 15% of calories were coming from canola oil. So for somebody getting 2,000 calories a day total, that would be about 300 calories, which is a little over two tablespoons. So bottom line there is that canola oil was better for lipids than saturated fat, but no clear superiority when it was compared to a couple other unsaturated vegetable oils. Okay, a common question is cold-pressed canola oil versus refined canola oil. Since the cold-pressed variety doesn't go through the heating and the deodorization and some of these production steps, a lot of viewers ask if it's safer. It might surprise you to hear that most trials don't specify which type of canola oil they use. They just say canola oil was given to participants. They don't explain if it was refined or unrefined or cold-pressed or what. An example of an exception is this trial that specified they used refined canola oil. And total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol dropped on the canola group. And this trial did not measure ApoB. So it seems the refined variety still retains lipid-lowering properties, at least for these metrics they measured. Okay, a lot of viewers say that they're not worried about canola in general, only when it's heated. So we tried to look for information on that context specifically. One trial, for example, put people on a canola oil-rich diet compared to a saturated fat-rich diet, including using those fats to cook. Total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and ApoB were all reduced on canola, whereas triglycerides, LP little a, and HDL cholesterol didn't significantly change. Now, I told you that most trials don't specify which type of canola oil they use, and that is unfortunately the case for these 
trials that use canola to cook. They don't say if it was cold pressed or refined or unrefined or what. So we tried to contact the authors to clarify this issue and we were able to get in touch with the authors of one study that used canola oil to cook. And they informed us they used refined canola oil fortified with vitamins A and D. Now, the only lipids that trial measured were triglycerides, and the group cooking with canola oil saw a reduction in triglyceride levels. And in that trial, canola oil was compared to olive oil and a mix of soybean and safflower seed oil. And both olive oil and canola reduced triglycerides, with no significant difference between the two. The group using soybean and safflower saw no significant change to triglycerides. Now, this trial capped the oil intake at 20 grams a day maximum, which is about 177 calories or one and a half tablespoons. So I think this forces the participants to use cooking techniques like sauteing instead of deep frying, for example, which might be relevant. We'll come back to this issue of cooking techniques later in the video. Now, randomized trials like the ones we've been looking at are great. They can tell us a lot. They can give us a lot of information. But one limitation is duration. They're usually short to medium term in the scale of months. So one thing we can do is look at long-term observational studies and see if they point in the same general direction. So one of these studies followed half a million people for 16 years and found that people who cook with canola oil had a lower risk of cardiovascular death than those who use butter to cook and roughly similar to olive oil. And these results are adjusted for BMI, smoking, exercise, overall dietary pattern, obvious confounders like that. Now, I think most people already expect a predominantly unsaturated fat like canola oil to be pretty good for lipids and cardiovascular disease, especially when we're comparing it to butter. So I don't think this segment is going to be mind-blowing for most viewers. So let's move on to other metrics that might be less obvious, like glucose metabolism, for example. And the same meta-analysis of 40-some trials found no significant effect on fasting glucose, fasting insulin, or insulin resistance when canola was compared to olive oil, sunflower seed oil, or saturated fat. Just like we said with the lipids, we can find a trial here and there that suggests a benefit of canola oil for metrics like fasting glucose or glucose tolerance, especially compared to saturated fat, but it doesn't reach significance in the meta-analyses. So I, I think it's better to be conservative and say that we don't see a reproducible difference. I just want to clarify something real quick. These trials looking at canola oil compared to another fat head-to-head, -head, usually the two groups are eating about similar total number of calories. And this is important because if you change the calories in one group, you might see an effect on glucose metabolism things like fasting glucose, insulin resistance, insulin levels, which are very sensitive to weight loss, but it might have nothing to do with the type of fat that people ate. I'm only bringing this up because we often see comments below where people say, well, my personal experience was this. It doesn't match the science you're showing. So there's something wrong with those studies. Bear in mind that if you lose weight, that impacts glucose metabolism very reproducibly regardless of the specific foods involved. We even see this effect on fast food diets, as long as the calories are low enough that people lose weight. I'm not saying that food quality doesn't matter. I'm saying that calories and weight loss by themselves have a very powerful effect on glucose metabolism and other parameters, and we have to bear that in mind. Okay, what about refined canola oil? Is that harmful for glucose metabolism? That trial we looked at a minute ago that used refined canola oil, they found no significant effect of canola on fasting glucose, but fasting insulin and insulin resistance improved in the canola group. And this is without weight loss. And by the way, it was a large amount of canola oil in that trial. Some trials use smaller amounts like one tablespoon, but this one went big, over 400 calories a day just from canola oil. So for somebody getting 2,000 calories a day total, that's almost a quarter of their calories coming from canola oil. So the regular variety refined canola oil doesn't seem to mess up glucose metabolism either, even at a substantial amount. What about cooking with canola oil? That trial where participants cooked 
with canola compared to saturated fat. Fasting glucose came down on canola and fasting insulin did not significantly change. And the other cooking trial where the authors kindly informed us they used refined canola oil fortified with vitamins A and D, fasting glucose, fasting insulin, and insulin resistance all came down on the canola group. The two comparison groups, as we said previously, were olive oil and mixed soybean safflower. In the olive oil group, there was no significant change to fasting glucose, but insulin and insulin resistance were reduced even more strongly than on canola, and there was no significant change to any of the three parameters on the mixed oil group. Again, limitation of these trials is duration. Some of these last for one month, four months, six months. So what if we eat canola oil for years? Two observational studies followed people for about 14 to 16 years, each one, and they report that cooking with canola oil was not associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes or diabetes mortality. And again, these are adjusted for BMI, smoking, exercise, etc. So just to summarize this section, the evidence I've seen so far consuming canola oil doesn't seem problematic for glucose metabolism, even when it's used to cook, with some limitations to the evidence. I would love to see more studies. I'd love to see some randomized trials lasting years and years. That's always unusual with single food interventions, but that would be great. And also for very specific questions, like what if we deep fry canola? What if we reheat it over and over? Right, for very specific questions, there's less information and so less confidence. We'll definitely circle back to this issue of certainty later in the video. Right now, let's move on to the next topic, which is body weight. Oh, real quick, just to touch on funding, because if we don't, there's going to be a hundred comments saying, who funded the studies, where did the money come from? So we went through and we have about two dozen scientific references in this video, and we found funding from canola or any vegetable oil industry in three studies, and then two others didn't receive funding, but the oil they used in the study was donated by the manufacturer. So we'll say that those are also conflicted. Debatable, but we'll say five studies that have some ties to industry, and then 20 or so that don't. So we could have made the video and just left out those five studies. It wouldn't fundamentally change the picture, but that's not how we do science. We don't dismiss evidence based on funding. We want to look at everything that's been done. We want to appraise data based on its scientific merit. And also when we hear about evidence that seems to go against a belief that we hold, we want to look at it. We want to evaluate it. We don't want to just dismiss things without looking. So on to canola oil and body weight. And there is a systematic review and meta-analysis of 23 randomized controlled trials looking at this exact question. And they report that canola oil consumption reduced body weight, particularly in participants with type 2 diabetes or when canola was compared to saturated fat rich foods. Now, I would take this reduction with a big grain of salt. The effect was small. It was a fraction of a kilo. And also most of the individual trials don't reach significance. There were a couple that showed a significant reduction. I've seen one trial out of everything that showed an increase in body weight and the majority show no significant difference, which is not that surprising because in most trials, there isn't much caloric difference in terms of total caloric intake between the group consuming canola and the comparison group. So I'm a little skeptical that the difference is real. It's possible. I wouldn't rule it out, but I'm not completely convinced. If there is a real difference there, it seems to be a small one. My only takeaway is that the available evidence doesn't indicate a concern in terms of canola oil being fattening, increasing body weight. Another relevant factor is that in the same meta-analysis that found a significant reduction in body weight on canola, there was no significant difference in BMI, waist circumference, or body fat. So that kind of aligns with the idea that there might not be much of a difference. Trials looking at satiety also agree with this idea that canola oil doesn't seem particularly fattening. Canola was at least as satiating as other oils, including unsaturated and saturated varieties. Of course, we all know oil is calorically dense. So if I add a lot of oil on top of my regular diet and don't remove anything else, yeah, it's gonna quickly add up and I'm gonna gain weight. But I can also eat high fat 
as long as the overall calories are reasonable, I'm not going to gain weight. I can even lose weight. That goes for any concentrated form of fat. A good example is that trial where they used refined canola oil, where they specified it was the refined kind. They also found no significant change in the canola group in body weight, BMI, or body fat. Even though, if you remember, they were getting over 400 calories of canola. But overall calories didn't change significantly. So neither did body weight and body fat. And heated canola, those couple trials we saw that used canola to cook with, also measured body weight, and there was no significant change in the participants who cooked with canola. In the trial using refined canola oil to cook, body weight, BMI, and waist circumference were not significantly changed on canola or the control group using mixed soybean and safflower, whereas people in olive oil saw a significant reduction in body weight and BMI, but not waist circumference. Interestingly, this trial also looked at measures of fatty liver. All the participants had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, before the trial. The mixed oil made no significant difference to liver span or fatty liver grading. They were neither worse nor better after the trial. And both olive oil and canola oil improved fatty liver. Over 66% of participants on olive oil and over 76% of participants on canola oil reverted to normal liver grading. So this is a pretty interesting result because canola didn't significantly reduce body weight, as we said a minute ago. Only olive oil did, and yet both improved fatty liver very strikingly. Now remember, this trial capped oil intake to 20 grams a day, which is about 177 calories, or one and a half tablespoons. So I imagine the participants were mostly sautéing, so please don't interpret this trial as giving us license to deep fry everything all day. So overall, the evidence indicates canola oil does not induce weight gain or associated metrics. Now, bear in mind, this is very important to point out, we are talking about canola oil itself, not hypercaloric snacks or fast food that happens to contain some canola oil together with a thousand other ingredients. That's a whole different ball game, and nobody recommends that anyway. So we're talking about canola oil to dress a salad, canola oil on some rice or some dish, sauteing something on canola oil, that kind of thing. I know there's social media messaging out there lumping everything together, but the actual science looks very different. The evidence indicates ultra-processed snacks and frankenfoods lead to weight gain, whereas canola oil itself, as we just saw, does not. Okay, next we're going to look at inflammation. And we actually made a behemoth of a video a while back on inflammation and seed oils, going over six or seven different kinds of oil, going over dozens of trials, so definitely check that out if you're interested in that topic. For canola specifically, that same large meta-analysis of 40-some trials we looked at also analyzed C-reactive protein, which is a common inflammatory marker, and they found no significant difference comparing canola to olive oil or sunflower seed oil. They didn't have a comparison to saturated fat for inflammatory markers. And that trial using refined canola oil also found no significant effect on C-reactive protein, IL-6, or MCP-1, all inflammatory markers. There's another trial that also looked at inflammation that had a very interesting experimental design because they put all the participants on an initial low vegetable oil diet for a period, and then after that, they transitioned them onto their test diets, one of which was a diet with added canola oil. The reason they do that is that people might already be eating some of these oils in their normal life. And so then you give them the same oil during a trial, you don't see much of a difference, but that might be obscuring an effect of the oil. So they use that initial diet, the, what's called the wash-in diet, to try to rule that out, but still didn't see any significant change to three inflammatory markers on canola oil in this trial. Now, of course, if it takes years and years for the inflammation to set in, then these trials aren't going to show anything. But that goes for any food. So the part of seed oils that people are usually the most worried about, especially when it comes to inflammation, is linoleic acid, which is a fatty acid. It's a polyunsaturated fatty acid, an omega-6. And there is long-term data on it. And it indicates that, if anything, people consuming more linoleic acid long-term tend to have lower levels of inflammatory markers. 
Before we move on to the next section, just a quick note that there are some studies out there looking at acute changes in inflammatory markers right after eating, what's called postprandial changes. Some inflammatory markers go up, some go down after eating, but it's unclear exactly what relevance this has because they often don't reflect the long-term levels of inflammatory markers in the blood. Also, we see these acute changes with both unsaturated and saturated fat meals. So this isn't specific to canola oil. It's just so you know it's out there in case you run into it. It's not a complete surprise. So we covered all of this and way, way more in that previous video. Definitely check that out for more details. For now, let's move on to oxidation, which is a really common question. And there are a few trials looking at markers of oxidation in either the plasma or the urine of people put on a canola oil supplemented diet and finding generally no significant difference even when canola oil is used to cook. So these are what's called in vivo assays. So measuring these molecules in the bodily fluids of living, breathing humans consuming canola. I also looked at something called 4-HNE, which a lot of people ask about. It's a product of lipid oxidation. So it's often seen in fats that are exposed to heat. HNE was undetectable in unheated canola, and even when exposed to heat, HNE formation was very low, even up to five hours of heat exposure. These levels were even lower than the values reported for butter, for example, in other studies. Now, because this is data from different studies, conditions aren't exactly matched. We want to be very careful here. I take this comparison with a big grain of salt. I just wanted to see this as a reference because the fat in butter is, of course, highly saturated. So the expectation is that it would be more heat stable. And yet, canola doesn't seem to perform any worse. The takeaway for me is that it's very low amounts of HNE in both, even after relatively prolonged periods of heat exposure. It's also an interesting realization that we tend to oversimplify these things. I hear people on social media often saying, well, that oil is unsaturated, so it's definitely going to oxidize. It's definitely going to cause all kinds of oxidation in your body. And yes, unsaturation is a factor. It plays a role. But there's all kinds of other factors that we also need to take into account that are part of the equation. Like, for example, the content of antioxidants in the oil, like vitamin E, for example, which can also inhibit oxidation. And vitamin E content is fairly high in canola oil. So we always need to look at the net effect of these things in living human beings and not just go with these guesses. So, so far, the evidence seemed to align. But then I also found some in vitro assays. In vitro basically means an experiment in a lab, in a test tube. For example, one called T-bars that suggested an increase in oxidation products in canola oil exposed to heat. So that seemed to clash with most of the data, including the in vivo results. Now, normally when we have in vivo and in vitro data that mismatch, we give more weight to the in vivo stuff, I think for obvious reasons. But we also want to understand why the test tube assays are giving an odd result. So I kept digging around in this field, in this specialized literature, and it seems that the T-bars assay has been widely criticized for its lack of specificity meaning that it can show a result that doesn't reflect actual oxidation. So, a false positive, and is generally not considered a reliable measure. Now, I'm completely open to other data, and we're going to make more content specifically looking at this question of oxidation, going through these assays individually, and really digging into this field, and probably try to bring on somebody with expertise who does these assays day in and day out. So just to summarize the oxidation section real quick, so far I haven't seen anything compelling showing oxidation in vivo, in living, breathing humans consuming canola oil, even when it's refined or even when it's used to cook. Now, that said, if you expose a fat to heat long enough, it will eventually degrade. So for people who choose to cook, with canola oil, probably a good idea to avoid very high temperatures like deep frying, for example, and probably smart to favor sauteing instead and light to medium heat. The smoke point 
is the temperature at which you start to see an oil emit smoke. And it's an indicator of heat stability. And the smoke point of canola is around 200 Celsius, give or take. So you want to try to stay under that. Also, probably a good idea to avoid very long cooking times, like hours, and also avoid reusing, reheating oils over and over. Last thing to say under this umbrella of oxidation is that we don't want to lose track of big picture. Exercise can cause oxidation. And that doesn't mean we avoid it. That doesn't mean it's toxic. So yeah, we want to understand all of these moving parts. We don't want to brush anything aside. But we also want to avoid these logical leaps. Always remember, net effect in a living, breathing human eating the food. Can't go wrong with that. One disease linked to oxidation is cancer. So a complementary approach to this question is to look at risk of cancer in people consuming canola. Large prospective studies report that people cooking with canola have lower risk of dying of cancer than those cooking with butter, for example, and not higher than people cooking with olive oil. And as we said before, these data are adjusted for confounders like smoking, exercise, BMI, etc. People cooking with canola also had lower risk of dying of respiratory disease and infection, and also lower all-cause mortality, so lower risk of total death of any cause. Before we get to the final recap, I just want to touch on a common question, which is comparing oil to nuts and seeds. So unprocessed sources of fat. There's not a lot of data on this question. And when it comes to canola oil specifically, the closest we could find is this trial, comparing nuts to a canola oil enriched cereal, which is not the same. There are some caveats there, but Basically, they found no significant difference between those two groups in total or LDL cholesterol, ApoB, triglycerides, body weight, BMI, waist to hip ratio, fasting glucose, or fasting insulin. We'll come back to this question of whole foods in a second when we touch on personal preference. Last thing I want to mention is a couple large, very famous trials that used canola oil as part of their intervention. And you might have heard of some of these. One is Lyon, which took people with high cardiovascular risk and put them on a Mediterranean diet with canola oil as one of the main forms of fat. And they ended up having about 70% lower risk of cardiovascular outcomes, like heart attacks, and 70% less death. The other big trial is called Finger. And they also put people on a Mediterranean diet with canola oil although they also had them exercise and do a couple other things. And they ended up seeing an improvement in cognitive function over time on this diet with canola oil. The obvious caveat of these trials is that they change a number of things. It's a multi-pronged intervention. So we can't attribute the benefits to canola specifically. But it's good to know these things exist and to understand the limitations. To summarize all of this information we went over, most of the evidence seems to point to safety of canola oil and even some benefits, better lipids and possibly lower risk of death of several causes, depending what we're comparing canola to. And no clear harm for glucose metabolism or body weight or inflammation. I have several areas of uncertainty where I'd love to see more evidence, especially specific questions. What happens with this exact type of canola oil cooked with this technique about over this exact amount of time, the more specific the question, the less confident we are. So we'll definitely keep an eye on this field going forward. Now, one thing is scientific evidence and what claims should and should not be made. Another thing is personal choice. And that's not my turf. That's up to you, my friends. Some people might prefer to buy cold pressed canola oil, even though data wise, we can't really tell if one is better. Some people might feel safer with that. I don't see a problem. Other people may prefer to not consume canola oil, period. Maybe you're not sure about the whole thing, or maybe you don't like canola oil. Don't eat it. It's not an essential food. We don't need canola oil in our diet. We don't need any oil in our diet. Some people prefer to not consume any oil and get all their fats from uh, whole foods. I don't see a problem with that either. So the next time an influencer tells you that canola oil is toxic, it's poison, very simple, ask for the evidence. You want to see some trials or some cohort studies where human beings eating canola oil 
are worse off than a reasonably matched control group. If they can show you that, great. I'd like to see it. If they can't show you that, but they insist on calling things poison and toxic and it's going to blow your head off and all this emotional verbiage based on storytelling, then I wouldn't take that content seriously on a scientific level. Here's that previous video on seed oils and inflammation, and here's more on seed oils and cardiovascular disease, with the president of the National Lipid Association guiding us through decades of science. Check those out. I'll see you over there.